Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moli wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted, so very honored, and so wicked happy that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcasts. Our guest today is Jacob Sager Weinstein. He is here to celebrate Princess Unlimited. Before we invite Jacob into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by the Power Of series of picture books by Ruth Maley. The Power Of Positivity, the ABCs of a Pandemic. The Power Of Kindness Through the Eyes of Children. And The Power Of Gratitude, Unlocking Hidden Treasures. These books are absolutely wonderful. Your kids will adore them. You'll love the lead character, Orbit. Orbit is just such a fun character. And Orbit helps your kids understand that life is better when we always choose to be positive, to be kind to others, and live gratefully. Happy for what we have. Happy to share what we have with others. These books will make a great addition to any family or any school library. Check them out today. You can find them on Amazon. Join us right now from London in the United Kingdom. Our guest is here today to celebrate Princess Unlimited. Please welcome to the show, Jacob Sager Weinstein. Hey, Jacob, how are you? I'm fine and happy to be here. I'm happy to have you on. Um, tell us all about Princess Unlimited, please. Sure. Well, Princess Unlimited, and since we're doing video, I can show people the book as well. Uh, princess Unlimited is the story of an entrepreneurial princess who saves her kingdom through kindness and hard work. And I wrote it, and the illustrator is an extremely talented illustrator named Reza Figueroa. So it has sort of the, the look to me of like a great classic Disney cartoon. I think it's really beautiful. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so an entrepreneurial uh, princess. Um, interesting. Yes. I've, I've never heard a princess referred to as entrepreneurial. Well, so, so you know, I think some books are inspired by you read a, a great book and you want to emulate it. Um, this one is one of the rare books that was inspired by a not very good book. Uh, when my daughter was, was very young, she went through a princess phase, as lots of kids do. And some of the books she read were wonderful. Um, but, but somebody gave her a really awful book about how the princess sits in the castle all day and looks pretty. And I just thought, surely there's better things a princess can do. So, so this is about a princess who starts her own business and then uses that to help fund the, uh, the, the kingdom that's fallen on hard times. I like that princess a lot better than the, the one in that bad book. Exactly. And, and again, I want to be clear, there's lots of wonderful other books about active princesses. There's the paper bag princess, the kite princess. Um, but just sort of, for whatever reason, that was not the book that my daughter was given. And it made me want to put one more book out in the world about a princess who actually gets things done and thinks for herself. Yeah, yeah. Y you know, it's, it's really interesting, I think, that um, the way you were looking at the books that your daughter was reading is the same way I was looking at books when my daughter was reading 20-something uh, years ago, uh, you're very, at least I was, very conscious about the messages that our, our girls, in, in particular, I, I was absolutely concerned and, and wanted to make sure that my son was getting good messages. But I was also okay with my son reading books about farts and monsters and uh, yeah. that, that stuff. It just entertained them and it was silly and it was harmless. But there are um, a lot of books, um, I guess, especially older books that are just, you know, that, that are targeted at girls that are just about be pretty, sit down, girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. And um, we don't expect you to do anything more. Yeah, I think you raise a good point about the older books, because I do think over the past 
15 years, there's been a real movement away from that. But because so often the books that we give children are the books we gave, we read ourselves. Um, and if you, if you're a grandparent, then the books you read as a child are from an even earlier age. And there's wonderful books that deserve to be read decade after decade. But along with that, I think we do sometimes accidentally perpetuate ideas that maybe in mainstream society have mercifully faded away, but that still live on sometimes in the books we give our kids, especially if we don't really read them ourselves and compare them to what we remember from childhood, which mm -hmm. may or may not be fair. Yeah. And, and I think it's important, too, to read them and compare them with what is happening today in the world. And if it is it and, and if it aligns with the values that we want to teach our kids, that's one of the things that we've celebrated here in the podcast is that reading with your kids is a great way to instill values in your kids. And uh, because of that, we need to be aware of what values the books are talking about. Absolutely. And, and I, I think that, that your point about reading with the kids is so important because if you're reading with your kids, then even if the values in the book aren't the values you want to teach, they can be a starting point for a discussion. You can say, what do you think of this? Do you think it has a message? Do you agree with the message? Um, and as a, the grown up, you can then guide what they take away from the book. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is, is so valuable and so important. Yeah. I think even at a very young age, my daughter, if she had read that first book about a princess sitting and being pretty, she would have said, I, I, I don't want to sit around the house all day. I want to go out and play football. Right, exactly. And, you know, uh, certainly the, the messages that they get from their, their parents and their family and their friends are so much, I think, going to be more influential than any one book. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's sometimes a cumulative effect. If you read a dozen books with a certain stereotype, you start to think, oh, okay, this is what life is like. Because I think when kids read books, they're triangulating the world and they're saying, ah, okay, this is this character, but maybe this is the larger points. And, you know, they're, they're learning a huge amount. And I think you just want to make sure you're there to guide them to learn the thing you want them to learn. Yeah. I, I also love the fact that you're introducing this idea of entrepreneurship to kids at a very young age. I think it's uh, I, th I think it's always been important, but I think now it's more important than ever because I think more and more uh, people are, are going to find their best opportunities when they're creating their, the opportunities. Absolutely. And I think kids are a natural audience for that message because kids have so much they, they haven't let they haven't been been taught by the world that they can't do things. And so they have an idea and they want to run with it. And I think anything we do to encourage that in a healthy direction is great. So, you know, in, in Princess Unlimited, she does the classic. Well, this was a classic thing when I was a kid. I don't know if kids still do this. She sets up a lemonade stand. Mm -hmm. um, and in her case, she's selling lemonade to the knights who are going off to fight the dragon. So they can have nice, cool lemonade before they face the fiery breath of the dragon. Um, but, you know, kids, that's something that kids, maybe there aren't dragons in the neighborhoods, but they can emulate it by setting up a lemonade stand or selling their crafts or whatever it is that is something they love doing they can then work in that direction. Yeah. You know, not, a couple of years ago, uh, right at the start of the pandemic, um, one of the daughter of one of our authors um, who spent a lot of, most of the first months of her life in the NICU in, in a hospital in Chicago, um, wanted to do something, wanted to give back and started making these little bracelets and she was selling them, and she actually raised over $50,000 at the age of seven years old. And uh, we had Haley Olinsky on to, to talk about what she did, and it was just incredible. And it's just a, a great reminder that whether you're selling lemonade to raise a few dollars so you can go to the movies, or you're selling bracelets so you can raise thousands to give to a children's hospital – uh, kids have incredible power and opportunity. That's very true. And I'm so glad you brought up the, the entrepreneurial spirit to the service of a good cause, because I think that's, you know, the kids who are going to be running businesses 20 years from now, it's great for them to learn early that they have a responsibility to the world, that it's not just about making the money for themselves. It's about what are you going to do with this money? How will the world be better for your actions when you've left it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I think that's really important. And I definitely think to, to me as a parent, I'm even more excited in a sense when my, you know, my son has done this. He recently, um, he's gotten interested in baking. So he's, he went sort of crazy baking to sell, uh, to, to do bake sales to raise money for his school. And I feel like that's fantastic. And that to me is the, the, the pride of helping your school, I think, will last so much longer than 
you know, making whatever a couple bucks are to put in your pocket or buy a toy you'll forget about in a month. So, yeah, I think that is a great use of the entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, and that's certainly the spirit that your princess takes to, you know, create this business that's going to help her kingdom. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Um, and so, so you know, in, in her case, all the proceeds from Lemonade go to rebuilding the kingdom and, and helping the people there. Um, so, yeah, so I, I really, I'd much rather kids take that lesson away that you can change the world for the better by being creative and entrepreneurial rather than you can enrich yourself. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot, to, we have a lot of authors who listen to the show, especially uh, new authors. And one of the messages that I try to share with authors, and it's a hard message for a lot of them to accept, is that when you become a children's author or any type of author, you are engaging in the entrepreneurial world. You are becoming, and well, if you want to be successful, you have to realize that you are becoming the CEO of your book. Um, you seem to be the CEO of your books uh, right now. What kind of advice can you give to the authors that are living, uh, excuse, listening? Yeah, it's funny. so actually, my, my, when I first wrote Princess Unlimited, the title I had was the CEO of Princess Incorporated. And then sort of running out by some kids, they had no idea what a CEO is, understandably. So it shifted. But yeah, no, definitely, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I do think that, that the single most important thing you can do is write a good book. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of, that we, we face so much rejection as writers. Um, we're constantly sending out and getting told no. I think it becomes very hard to know whether we're getting rejected because it's not a good book or just because it's sort of, it's a brutal business. Um, but, but I think if you can test it on kids who don't know you, if you can get feedback from other writers and really be cold hearted and looking at your own work and saying, you know, can I cut this word? Can I, re can I change this story around? Is this, even though I've spent a year on this idea, maybe there's a better idea that I should be working on instead. They're really hard questions, but if you can ask yourselves that, then, then you're starting with something that speaks to people and connects to people. And then it becomes so much easier to get over the sort of the hurdle of spreading the word and reaching out to people. Yeah. Um, but even then, it is a very subjective and frustrating business. And it's just so hard to know whether your book, when you put it out in the world, is going to reach people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you brought up something about, you know, being able to let go of a project that you've worked on for a year and not only let go yes. of it, but to move on to the next thing because – just because plan A doesn't work, it doesn't mean that you're a failure. It just might mean that this isn't the time for it or creating that plan A inspired you to do something that is going to sell. Absolutely. And I think, I think honestly, even if it is a failure, I think that, that our society makes failure a negative thing. I think if you have never failed, it's a sign that you've never taken risks. You've never stressed yourself. So if you try something and you fail, that's, in a way, a good thing. It's letting you know you're not taking the easy path. You're not repeating yourself. You're not just doing stuff that's guaranteed success. And I think as long as you can take lessons from that failure and say, okay, here is what worked for me. Here is what was meaningful. How can I apply that to whatever the next thing is? Then I think you have succeeded, however you want to define that. Yeah. And these are great lessons to share with our kids as well. Yes, absolutely. And so when I, when I talk to kids, uh, one of the things I show is I have a spreadsheet where I track all the rejections I've gotten. And I always, that's one of the main slides I want to show them is, you know, here are the 180 rejections I've gotten and the, the 10 books that have been published. And it's a really hard way. And, and you know, back in the days where I used to get rejections in the mail instead of email, I had a big folder and I'd save all my rejections just to sort of have this visual record of my progress, right? Because if you have 20 rejections between you and the next success, then every rejection you get is just bringing you closer to ultimate success. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a conversation with somebody. Um, one of the things that I learned and uh, becoming an educational magician, doing educational magic shows at schools, I quickly learned that uh, if it took me 100 phone calls or email, uh, emails or actually letters in the mail, uh, and I received three or five responses, that was actually a good thing. And it was a great response, and it was a huge success. That was a real hard thing for me to get my my head around. It really is. And and the thing is that, that it's easy to look back and say, okay, well, these 
you know, these 10 things that I sent out that I got no's for, that was a waste of time. And if, if you were psychic and you knew what the one yes was, then sure, you could just jump right to that. But mm-hmm. you don't. And so it's not that those 10 no's were failures and the one yes was a success. It's that those 11 tries collectively were a success. So if you send out 100 requests for performances and you get a couple of yeses back, those 100 attempts collectively were a huge success. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What a great way to look at things. Hey, one of the thing, one of the books that really caught my attention on your website was uh, one titled "How to Remember Everything." As I'm yes. as I'm closing in on age one hundred, I think I need to <laughs> learn uh, how to remember anything. Yeah, definitely. And so, and in a way, this ties back to a discussion about sort of becoming better and learning from your your mistakes and your failures. So, when I was a kid, I had the worst memory in the world, and the, I think the worst, the most absent-minded thing I ever did is there was a time I sat down at a desk and I picked up a pencil in my right hand and I tried to write and I couldn't. And I sat there for five or ten minutes before I realized, oh, wait a minute, I'm left-handed. And then I put it in my left hand and I was like, this is how absent-minded, I forgot which hand I write with. And then I was fine. But so, and I, you know, any class where you could make things up like writing, I did fine, or figure things out like math, I was okay. But if you had to remember it, like biology or history, I was a disaster. And it wasn't until I got to my 20s that I learned that there are memory techniques, that memory is a skill you can learn. Um, but for some reason, we demand that kids memorize things, but we never teach them these techniques, uh, many of which have been around literally for centuries. And somehow we just expect kids to get by without them. Um, so the, the most famous one, you may have heard of this, is the Mind Palace or the Memory Walk. You might know that from Sherlock. I don't. Yeah. Re- remind us what it is. Okay, so, um, so, uh, and I say that's famous, it's only if you've seen the, uh, the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock Holmes series. He's always talking about his mind palace. So, basically, a lot of memory techniques, the way they work is you take something that's hard to remember, like a shopping list, and you transform it into something that's easy to remember, like the path around your own home. So, if you were trying to remember your shopping list, um, you might picture, like, you're, you wake up in your own bed, and then you picture... If eggs are the first things you need to buy, you picture eggs on your pillow making a big mess when you lay down. And that's a very weird thing. And now milk is the next thing. So you picture you reach out to your alarm clock and you knock over a jug of milk and it spills on your carpet. And you mentally go through your house place by place in sort of the order you would do it on an ordinary morning, putting these crazy images at each location. And because they're so vivid, you remember them. And because they're attached to something that you know by heart, which is your house, you can easily retrieve them. Um, and so some people have multiple mind palaces to remember different things. They might have one they reuse for a different shopping list. They might have one where they've stored the presence of the United States. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a, a weird thing that's based on these crazy images. But exactly because it is so crazy, it helps the thing stick out. Wow. That's, that's really cool. Now, does it ever happen that you, you know, the, 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 the kind of list that you create for the, for your shopping extension excursion on Monday of one week, uh, gets transposed and that's what you remember three weeks later when you need something completely different. So there's a, a phenomenon called interference, which is where two memories interfere. Uh, and sometimes if you, if you try to remember a word, and you remember the wrong word first, and then no matter what, you can only remember that wrong word, and you can't, and it's interfering with the right word. So that can happen. Memories can interfere. Some people, if they have a reusable mind palace, will clear it. So they might imagine just waking up in bed on an ordinary day with no eggs, and just blank throughout, and then that clears it for them. For me, the benefit of being so absent-minded is that it naturally fades over time. <laughs> and I just do it anew. But for things like, but there are certain things that I... I have a mind palace that I reuse, um, which is like walking through my old high school. Um, but then I have other mind palaces, like the first presence of the United States, I have stored in my brother-in-law's house, just because it happens to be, he lives in Washington, D.C., that's where the presidents are from, why not? Um, but so I think, I, because I, I use that for a specific standing one, then if I started putting groceries in it, I'd get confused. I'd be like, am I supposed to buy George Washington? No, no. But, but for me, it, it does usually work out. Hey, you know, you mentioned to me early before we started recording that you grew up in the States, but now you've been living in the United Kingdom for the last 20 years or so. I, I think a lot of people feel a lot of a lot of people in the States feel a lot of kinship with with folks in, in the UK. But what's the biggest 
difference between the two cultures that, that you experienced or that surprised you was different? Oh, well, so, so especially moving from Los Angeles, which is where I was living before I came here, L.A. is a place of hyperbole where everything is the greatest thing ever. and It's amazing. You've got to do this. And then in, in the U.K., especially in England, understatement is much more valued. So um, I, I sometimes, so when I first moved here, for example, I, I used to do TV and film. And when I moved here, I was talking with somebody who was producing a TV show. And she said, oh, you know, the, the director is sort of difficult to work with but maybe you'll find it amusing how weird she is and it's okay. I was like, wow, I don't want this job. And then later on I learned it was like this incredibly prestigious award-winning director, but she had to, if she said that, she'd seem like she was bragging. Mm -hmm. So she was like being very understated. And in my used to LA way, I totally missed the subtext. And I think now I'm here long enough that if somebody started really insulting something, I'd be like, wow, they must be really proud of it. But, Interesting. That's really interesting. Now, does that when you're when you're writing, do you have to keep that in mind if you're writing for a, a, a book that you are hoping is going to break in the U.S. market, or as opposed to something you're hoping is going to break in the U.K.? It's interesting. When I first started uh, sending my my first kids' book, uh, which is uh, High Synth and Secrets Belief, which is set in London, actually, when I started sending that out to agents. I sent that out to American agents and UK agents and also some picture books to agents from both countries. And I kept getting more interest from the American agents. And finally, a British agent explicitly told me, your sensibilities are much more American than they are British. Just focus on America. Uh, and indeed, especially with picture books, I think if you gave me one book from America and one book from the UK, I could tell you which was which, um, even if you like, you know, fix the spelling so mm -hmm. they were the same. Um, but I, I think that because I grew up in the U.S. and that was where my childhood was, and because I'm writing books for my kid self, I think I just naturally fall into that American frame, frame of mind. Occasionally, I catch myself using a British phrase that I might have to, to tweak. Um, but I think my outlook remains fundamentally American after being here all this time. Is there a big difference uh, between writing children's books and writing for TV? Uh, so, so there is and there isn't. So the, you know, I think with any time you switch genres or medium, there's some things you take with you. Uh, and so I think a lot of us become writers because we love words and storytelling. And something that is hard when you start writing for film or TV, because it's so visual, you have to learn to let the pictures tell the story. Uh, and it turns out that's great training for writing picture books, mm -hmm. because just like when you're writing a, for TV or film, you're letting the actors do some of the work, the camera do some of the work. When you write picture books, you have to leave room in your text for the artist to be a storyteller as well. So that was really useful. Um, I found when I was writing a novel for children, uh, which is High Ascent and the Secrets Beneath, I had trained myself to focus on the exterior stuff. So obviously when you're writing film or TV, you can only write what can be seen by the camera. Mm -hmm. And obviously when you write a, a, a novel, you can be much more interior. So I had to really almost throw out my first draft because it was so focused on the exterior aspects um, it, was after, it was in the third person originally, and I rewrote it entirely in the first person as a way of forcing myself to get in that character's head. Uh, and, and it only started working at that point. Wow. Uh, uh, so this, this is fascinating. I'm having a lot of fun, but um, we're limited with time. And I know people are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about Princess Unlimited and maybe how to remember everything and the other great stuff coming from Jacob Sager Weinstein. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I'm not great about updating my website. It is jacobsagerweinstein.com. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter on Jacob SW. Um, or the best, even better, just if you have a local bookstore, just go to them and ask them to order How to Remember Everything or Princess Unlimited. Uh, if you don't, you can also obviously do that at whatever online retail giant you have access to. Uh, but I think just looking for those books may be the, the best way to find me. Yeah. We've had a really fun time speaking to the author Princess Unlimited, Jacob Sager Weinstein. Hey, my friend, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. It's been great. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Kyle Lukoff. Kyle will be here to celebrate different kinds of fruit great middle grade novel. Hey, we want to invite you to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids. 
at Reading With Your Kids on Instagram, at Reading With Your Kids on TikTok, and at Jedly Magic on Twitter. Please also be sure to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. You can uh, sign up for our free newsletter. We're revamping it. We're adding uh, author profiles and great fun things for kids to do. You, you don't want to miss that. And also, oh, 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 please be sure to use the contact button at the top of readingwithyourkids.com to let us know what we're doing right, let us know what we could be doing better, and to let us know who you would like to hear on a future episode of the podcast. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, I want to start by thanking our guest, Jacob Sigurd Weinstein. Please be sure to check out Princess Unlimited. Also want to thank our sponsor, The Power of Series by Ruth Maley. The Power of Positivity, The Power of Gratitude, and The Power of Kindness. Three great books that would make a great addition to your family library. I want to thank my staff, Fatima Khan, Rory, Grady, Skyler, Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to join together to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.